Welcome to the On-Premise IT Roundtable Podcast, the only show that dares to be both on topic and on location, or on premise and on premises. Each time we meet, we bring together IT luminaries to discuss a single concept or premise. In this episode, well, we're taking a break from enterprise IT and we're gonna talk about running your own website. Um, and in fact, we're gonna say you probably shouldn't do that. Uh, really, if it's important to you, you should let somebody else run your website. Isn't that right, guys? Let's meet our panel. I'm Stephen Foskett at S. Foskett on Twitter. Ethan Banks at EC Banks and at Packet Pushers. Adam Fisher at Bonzo VT. And I'm Gabe Mentz, and you can find me on Twitter at G Mentz. So all of you have run websites. All of you have tried self-hosted. You've tried fully managed. Um, and I imagine that there's going to be some disagreement on this point, because there are pros and cons. Uh, Ethan, I know you got a whole list of pros and cons right in front of you. <laughs> I do. You're so organized. Um, that's why I'm not going to start with you. Adam, should you or should you not run your own website? Well, for me, it was kind of an easy decision. I am relatively new to blogging and running my own website. So, um, you know, just to get my foot in the door, it was kind of the easy button to say, okay, I want to start out with the basics. I want to just get this very basic, you host it, you do everything for me. All I want to do is focus on blogging. So um, that was very good because it got me into um, that space and, and, and got me doing the thing that I really wanted to learn how to do. But in the process of doing that and getting better at it and building the site a little bit, I realized, well, all these things that I want to maybe kind of customize that are locked for me or plugins that I want to install, I don't have access to do that. So um, it got me looking about the possibility of doing it on my own and moving off from having someone else host it to, you know, what can I do that gives me a little bit more access and more capabilities than I have right now. So uh, just for the, for the record, so you are or are not self-hosting? Um, I am not self-hosting self -hosting currently. Are you using like WordPress.com? Yes, WordPress.com. Okay. All right, so that's, so that's the easy thing. That's the reason maybe many people do. They jump on WordPress.com because it's easy. Gabe? Um, so I think it comes down to are you a control freak or are you not a control freak, right? And so as coming from the infrastructure space, there's a lot of control freaks in our industry, and so we all kind of like to build it ourselves and, and spend our, a lot of energy on those pieces. Um, I don't build my own website, and I don't believe anybody should to get the ball moving. If it is a source of friction for you to take a step um, in trying to provide some value, and you're sitting there trying to craft your own WordPress plugins and your own theme editors and all of these different things, even though that might be kind of cool and nerdy, uh, I don't think there's a lot of value in that. So I would be on the side of uh, don't build your own website to get started. Okay. Ethan? Well, to get started, no. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Uh, but what you are giving up if you use someone else's platform to host your website is a lot of that control. You can no longer at that point install any plugin you want. You maybe will have difficulty integrating with a service like Cloudflare. Uh, or not, it could be that the service you're using gives you a special plugin that lets you integrate with Cloudflare if that's something you want to do. My point being, you're limited to what that platform gives you. Some platforms you can put in one any, any plugin you want. Other platforms tightly limit it. Uh, so if all you want to do is just to get started and start writing, then you should just start there. Use someone else's platform. But as you discover what else you might want to do with that site, it may make more sense to uh, go ahead and host that site yourself because then you can be the control freak, put in any plugin you want, <laughs> do whatever you want. But, of course, now you've just taken on all that risk. Yeah, and that's that's really the thing. So um, there's there's risk versus control. I think a lot of us um, would be perfectly happy um, hosting or having somebody else run the, run the site for us, except for limitations, except for annoying things like, uh, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, you know, the, the support and, and of course, the, the cost too. Um, and Enrico is pointing out here, you know, I mean, one of the big reasons that you don't want to run your own website is because you have somebody to call. Uh, I remember we got, ha we got, Ukrainian hackers got into ours uh, one day, and uh, I was fully hosted. I just contacted support and said, fix this, and went back to shopping. So I'll, I'll add to that, though. <laughs> if you end up running your own website, uh, you can partner with a developer. Now, that's not going to be as cheap as calling your hosted service and saying, fix this. But if you're working with a developer that knows your system very well, that can help you with 
a Ukrainian hacker. Or, or in our case, we've actually moved recently from hosting on someone else's platform to building a box ourselves that is going to host those, that does host the websites for us. And it's been China. We've had different IP blocks in China that aren't hacking us so much as doing denial of service with just, just punching many, many, many requests per second at the website and we've got to filter them off with a firewall to, so that the site stays up. Uh, so those are definitely downsides. That's up to you. But you can augment yourself with uh, a developer or someone that uh, you, you pay to keep around. And, and, but that's money, you know, so it's all what your goals are. If you're on a tight budget, then you don't want to engage with the developer. Yeah, it comes down to kind of what is your core competency, right? So yeah. if, you're a, if you're a big retailer and you are driving 60% of your commerce through your website, then... You probably want to have a little bit more control about what you're doing and what you're providing there, right? But uh, if it's not one of your core competencies, but you just need web presence because that is just part of what you need to have in our society today, then, you know, is that going to be a, a focal point for you? So it really comes down to what is, what is your core competency and what are you trying to get out of the website? Well, what are you trying to get out of the website is another thing. So, so scale is a potential concern. Uh, if your site becomes more popular, so instead of doing tens or hundreds of uh, you know, page views per day, you're starting to get into thousands, actually performance can matter. And mm -hmm. the amount of plugins that you're running on the site, if you're running a WordPress site, can really impact your performance, especially as you begin to ramp that up. Um, those and that page, really page views per day. Too. We had a fully hosted, an expensive fully hosted WordPress site. Um, and their answer, whenever we complained about performance, we were getting 500 errors, we were getting you know, yep. non-responsive and so on, and their answer was basically to throw it back at us and say, oh, well, you're using too many plugins, and can yep. you profile your plugins? Can you uninstall this stuff? Oh, you shouldn't be using this, or you shouldn't be using that. I'm like, what the heck? We, we went through exactly that same challenge where the hosting provider would throw it back to us and say, you know, your plugins are too complex, or we don't know what's wrong, we don't know why your website is slow, and through the process of migrating from the hosting provider to being self-hosted, we found out what was really going on under the hood, and it was a lot of poorly optimized code, uh, in fact, on the part of the hosting provider, uh, some of the way that they were doing their back-end integrations. We were able to fix all of that, and so there was a power that came there, that can go back to that control freak thing, where we were able to discover deeply what's happening with the website and fix it and get control of those performance issues that we didn't get the insight nor the help we needed from the hosting provider. But that's only a problem that crops up when you start pushing the volume. Sure. Yeah, and that's, that was another thing that really uh, you know, got to us as well. So one of, I mean, the real root of our problems was that they didn't want to give us the memory or the uh, storage I.O. that our, our website needed. And like I said, even though we were on a pretty expensive plan, mm. that just didn't fit with their, with their business model. They wanted us to step up to an even more expensive plan so we could have SSD storage and so that we could have more memory. And I'm like, really, guys? So <laughs> That's interesting that you say that because if you just buy a hosting, some kind of a hosting instance in, in the cloud where you get uh, infrastructure as a service, you go ahead and load up your own operating system, you can get a lot more uh, bang for your buck in that way. Of course, the downside being now you own the whole stack. Now you're owning probably Linux and all of whatever it's got in that distro, plus the WordPress instance or database backend and so on that you're running on the back end. So let's bring it back to it. So, Ethan, uh, you guys are you guys self-hosting now, right? We are now, yes. Okay, so um, what are the big problems with self-hosting? What are the big challenges? Why shouldn't people do this? Uh, stability. You're, you're picking up any, it's a data management problem and it's an ops problem like you would have in any enterprise. You own it all soup to nuts. So if you are getting hit with a dial of service attack, you need to figure out what's going on, solve that problem. If you are uh, having a performance issue, you've got to figure out what the issue is and solve it yourself. And so then you own that box from, from beginning to end. You can't necessarily just focus on writing. You're going to get distracted from time to time to fix the website and sure. bring it back up. Yeah, and in, in my scenario, you know, I'm definitely kind of like, you know, pretty small scale. I've, I've got a little thing going on, and I've, I've looked into the possibility of hosting, doing it uh, self-hosted and doing all of that. And in the time that I spent trying to figure out, all right, well, how do I move this? And when I do move it, how am I going to administer it and keep all that up? I realized, you know, I'm, I don't have a lot of free time as is, and I'm wasting cycles on not doing what I really intended this site to yeah. do in the first place. So, just a lot of the reason people move all their email up to a cloud provider, right? I mean, yeah. it's like, do you want to run Exchange servers on, and manage all of those things, or is it just you need email and you just, you know, 
going to trust somebody else to kind of take care of that email component. I think it will be, a, regardless of which way you start off, it, it, what I have found is going to be a bit of a, of a journey and an evolution. So what works for you today will probably change and there will probably be some new services or, you know, new competencies or, or what have you. But um, I guess my biggest thing is, is get, get rid of the friction to get started and get moving and don't spend a lot of time figuring out, should I put it on DigitalOcean? Should I put it on WordPress? Should I just go out to get a Squarespace account or something like that? Um, and uh, and, and it, just knowing that you're probably going to have to change as, as things go forward forward and hopefully you're wildly successful and scale and performance and all those kind of things become an issue because just make uh, sure your content's portable so that you can yeah. migrate somewhere else when you want to which is kind of in the checkbox for wordpress it tends to be very easy to move your data from word, one wordpress instance to another export it import it mm -hmm. well and there are other tools as well um you know i mean we uh sure. yeah so um I guess maybe what we should do is um, because you shouldn't run your own infrastructure unless you're really ready to deal with these challenges, let's talk about dealing with these challenges. Um, security, uh, word, for, word, word fence. Word fence, yes. Is, uh, yeah, amazing. Yeah, word fence is, it's not free. Well, there is a free instance of it, but if you want all the features, it's a reasonable annual cost that gives you uh, full firewalling, uh, IP white and blacklists. Uh, it knows uh, logins, people that are hammering away at a user account trying to, to break into it and so on, and then can automatically block IPs for you that uh, are doing such bad things. Uh, wonderful plugin, yeah. What else for security? Oh, I mean, there's that's a bunch the, of them. There's that's a, a the big one for me. I mean, Kismet is there, right, for to help you with uh, anti-spam uh, comments and so on, and, and does a few other things. There's um, uh, Jetpack from from WordPress, from the automatic folks, has a lot of security functionality built in. It's an interesting option, but, but just going back to WordFence, it does go to the top of my list. Anybody other security ideas? Uh, one one thing that we did, uh, ours is fully Dockerized, uh, fully containerized. Every element of the word of the website runs in a separate container and communicates on a backend network. So basically, uh, the only thing that a client can actually access is a nginx reverse proxy, and everything inside is protected from the outside in a container. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about that is that if anything does happen, you can just drop the container and bring it back up again, and you're back to where you started. Um, so we're not running anything in Docker. Uh, we just have um, standalone instances, but you know, we do have IP chains in front of it, and we also, with the hosting provider that we're using, have their own firewall that we can block before anything actually hits the instance, uh, the Linux distro that we're running the web server on. So there's a couple of filters that you're going through before you actually can uh, hit the website, which is how we handle some of the denial of service attacks that come in. Yeah, and WordFence also works as well with the uh, uh, HD access file. Mm -hmm. I'll rewrite that. And then, of course, there's Cloudflare, which is another big security yes. tool. Uh, are you all using Cloudflare? Because um, they've got you know, really, really great, uh, great tools in there as well. Yeah, the, the way that works, your DNS ends up resolving to a Cloudflare IP that is sitting in front of your website, caching it, and uh, has a lot of security functionality built in, so it can peel off a lot of negative traffic for you before it would ever actually hit your back-end website. I'll actually just point out, uh, Cloudflare just signed up to present at Tech Field Day. Um, oh, cool. So that's going to be a lot of fun to be able to talk to them about how that all works. I I've heard some of their guys present before. They are they got some really interesting engineering people. Yeah, that should be good. So another thing Ethan brought up is Jetpack, and this is kind of a controversial topic for a lot of people running WordPress. Um, I uh, personally, I, I, I would like to use Jetpack, but I just went through it and I found nothing compelling in it at all. I'm not using it anymore. Used to. Uh, it had the nice stats package. But, Any, uh, Jetpack, up, thoughts but. on that? I, I'm not hosting my own stuff, so I, that, <laughs> some of these plugins and pieces are... I'm just not well, daily day to day with it. WordPress.com has a lot of the Jetpack features built in, right? Yeah, there's some built in, and but I mean, it kind of goes to what you were talking about earlier with, uh, you know, do you want that control? And it looks like obviously, if if you have the self-hosting and you and you can architect some of this stuff in and make it, you know, by using Docker. Um, containers, you can kind of build it out the way that you want, and and really be focused on that security aspect. But um, yeah, right now for me, it's just WordPress.com. So um, other uh, downsides of running it yourself, um, you know, stability and updates. Um, 
you know, I just said Jetpack wasn't compelling. One thing Jetpack does offer is automatic plugin updates. Would you do that? I do automatic app updates on my phone, so I would, would probably, to get started, do that, yes. Um. We have a lot of plugins that tend to have dependencies, so I run them manually, but I'm using a backup package called Updraft Plus. Updraft Plus will, uh, once you've installed it, knows that you're about to do a plugin update and says, hey, I'm going to back everything up before you run the plugin update. Okay? Okay. And then it's fairly easy to restore, uh, which I guess you could file that under security. I mean, it's, it's data management. It gets you to uh, Updraft Plus, gets you to a point where you can go back to a known good instance of uh, WordPress if you've configured it appropriately. So. So, and that brings the next topic would be backups. Are you guys doing backups? Absolutely. <laughs> we did. <laughs> <laughs> we get some shaky heads. Uh, there's a bunch of great backup tools. Um, there's WP Time Capsule, um, which is, is really solid. Um, you know, there's Jetpack um, that can protect you. Um, there's also just random rare little dumps and things. Updraft Plus is nice in that you can integrate it with a lot of um, object stores. So you can dump your entire WordPress database to an Amazon S3 bucket if you want, or to Dropbox, or several other sources that they support, or destinations that they support, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we're doing with Time Capsule our, mm -hmm. ourselves as well. Yeah, Yeah, content is king, right? So you got to make sure you have it protected and backed up. And yeah. It would suck to lose that stuff. So Horribly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, all right, so more, um, you know, self-hosting problems. You know, you've got to monitor infrastructure. Uh, you know. Well, you, we got, you got to monitor infrastructure. Um, part of that is certificate management, something we haven't talked and about we yet. we haven't talked so about that yet. Yep. If you're in the HTTPS world, which you, you should be for... <laughs> Definitely should be. There's, we don't even need to discuss why. Let's assume you, we're all in HTTPS. Well, now you've got to manage certificates. I just got a notice from Let's Encrypt. Hey, you're certain this site's going to expire pretty soon. You should do something about that. So that's a... Something that some of the hosted sites actually handle for you, they just keep a certificate on your site. You don't really have to deal with it. Once you check the box, it's just done. Whereas Adam, if are you're you, hosting uh, yourself. Are you HTTPS? <laughs> yes, yes. And it's just done. Yeah. Yeah, so having these conversations about like all these things you can do is kind of, you know, it, yeah. it gets me to the point where I'm like, okay, this, this makes sense. I'm not that big. All I want to do is, you know, get content out there so it doesn't make sense for so me make, personally. Make you to, think twice about having to go host it yourself. Yes. Like all these extra considerations yes. you got to take into account. Yeah, I don't exactly. mean to interrupt you on that, on the, oh, Ethan, but yeah, you, you know, let's encrypt. Absolutely. You got to. Yeah. Um, and that's another nice thing. So my Dockerized system automatically uh, updates let's encrypt hmm. certificates. It automatically issues them and it automatically updates them. That is slick. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, IPv6, yep. I mean, no one cares, but if you do care, then uh, you know, that's something that not all the hosting providers will, will give you. But if you can find a cloud uh, service that will allow you to assign IPv6 to your instance, that's great. Drop in your quad A record, and now you're on the V6 internet. That's going to matter increasingly. Um, but it's something that not all the hosting services have, but it's one more thing to remember and uh, track uh, if you're hosting the site yourself. And of course, Cloudflare can do both of these things for you too. Yes, it can give you certificates, and it can give you. Uh, It'll be a, a V6 proxy, effectively, yeah. in front of you if you're on a V4 only site. Yeah. So, um, but it's interesting. A lot of this stuff, uh, you know, like like Adam was just saying. Uh, frankly, a lot of this stuff is stuff that's just taken care of if you're not hosting your own site. Yeah. What are you guys using to monitor traffic in terms of? Stats and views and things like that. I don't believe in website statistics. <laughs> there, solved. <laughs> no, I don't. Nothing. Ethan? You don't believe in website statistics and you just qualify that? I do not do stats. Full stop. So, okay, I believe in I don't in know stats. how many traffic we're getting. I don't know who's looking at it. I don't have any of that. <laughs> so I do believe in that because you need to be able to track uh, volume and get a sense of why people are showing up at your site. So general trends, either for volume... Uh, I think is, is relevant and important. It kind of helps you understand what's interesting on your site and what people are uh, reading and why and where they came from. Uh, as you start to get into all the stuff that the Google um, Analytics offers, it gets pretty bonkers in there, and I'm not sure how much of that data is actually useful. There's lots of it. I don't know how much of it matters. Analytics seems so focused on the advertising-based sales channel. It's yeah. like everything they do is advertising-based sales funnel. And, funnel, yeah. And those stats don't so mean anything annoying. to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and, and I'm not interested in that model. It's not about driving people to an action. It's about sharing good content and letting the content speak for itself, which 
10 years ago when you were building out your website and the SEO model, the words mattered the most. It isn't as simple as that anymore. Uh, and Google Analytics has gone to exactly what you're saying, the ads and, and the funnel, as opposed to helping you understand words and you know, page landing and so on. And for that, um, there are other tools, right? I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I know I'm insane. <laughs> so, so you guys need to talk stats. Uh, what do you think, Gabe? What, what, what I think stats guess? makes you know it's it's good to baseline pieces and just see what content people are hitting for me. Like, so what's resonating? So, just simple yep. things like, um, is my is, was my messaging on this particular topic? Do people like that style versus this style? So, for me, it's just when I create content, what kind of content are people liking to consume? So, I use stats from that perspective. Yep. Um, to understand, oh, I should do more of this and maybe a little bit less of this because that's what people like right now. So, do, do you look at referrers? I, I look at referrers. I look at my, you know, my. I, I, it's I have five or six blog articles which continue to remain my top five or six blog articles, and they're five to six years old. And it's just amazing to me that this stuff. And maybe there's that's because. It's been in the system for a while, and that's yeah. it's coming up on the first couple pages of Google searches or what have you. But like, it just amazes me that that is still relevant. It's on RV tools and uh, integrating with Microsoft Excel, and for me, <laughs> it's just like seems. But it's my top hit on my po on my on my site, and so I guess people find that important. So <laughs> I wrote an article in DHCP snooping like five or six years ago that still gets lots of traffic. Like, really? That's yeah. yeah, I guess that's a thing. Yeah, that's right. Do you but, look at stats, Adam? I do, yeah. And I, it's it's interesting. I've noticed similar trends and uh, it's it's just interesting to go in and see what people, you know, keep coming back to and, and what's up there. So for me, for someone who's just trying to deliver content, it's uh, I, I I don't think I use it as much to focus on what my content should be moving forward, but just, um, you know, kind of interest in, oh, wow, I'm doing this, and people are actually consuming it, which is pretty cool to see. So does stats have a, a, something to say about whether or not you should host your own site? Because, of course, if, if, you're, if you're not self-hosted, then, you know, all that, if, you're, if you're, somebody else is hosting it, maybe they're handling a lot of those things for you, right? Well... What do you mean? Stats I would, like I would like, hope like, so. like Word Defense gives you a lot of stats about mm. a lot of the negative things that are happening on your site. Is that what you're getting at? It, well, I, I could argue that that's not actually useful because who cares? Um, I don't care how many how many attacks Word Defense blocked. I only care about the ones that it didn't block. Fair. Um, <laughs> I think stats could help though, and to understand if you wanted, maybe you are uh, getting started and somebody else is hosting it, and all of a sudden you see this huge ramp and people starting to look at your content. So is it now? Uh, should I get into the business of hosting some of my own things for some of the reasons Ethan brought up before? Right, the, the ability to scale, the ability to address performance, and and some of the timeout errors and things like that. So I think that might be a, a, an early indicator that hey, maybe you need to take the next step into. You know the next maybe, it, but maybe it's hosted. It's just the next package of hosting or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Have you found that hosting providers actually monitor your stats and tell you when you need to move up, or is it just the other way around? Because I was really disappointed in that. That again, my full service hosting provider, they weren't actually watching my traffic. They weren't doing anything. I mean, they were sending me like kind of automated over blah blah alerts. But um, I ended up having to use like uh, you know site sensor kind of things to find out if my site was up or down because they weren't monitoring that at all. I've seen the same experience. I think it'd be a huge upsell opportunity for them, you too. Think. But <laughs> hey, your blog is booming. You yeah, want to move up to the next that, plan? That's right. Oh, we, I, I didn't, we've never run into that either. Um, we'd have bad performance on the site. We'd raise a case. They'd say your CPU's high. It's like, well, shouldn't you be telling us that? You know, why do I have to raise a case when my site performance is tanking? Yeah, I, I'm really disappointed in the service that I've gotten from some of these things. I guess you can tell that. So, um, you know, just to sum up then, um, I'll give you guys each one last chance to say, um, should you or shouldn't you be hosting your own site? And I'm going to leave you for last because we're going to try to convince you, Adam. So, um, uh, Ethan, should you or shouldn't you be hosting your own site? I'd say not unless you need it. And when you need it is when you're, you've grown to the point that you need the customizations on the site and you have special things you want to do that your hosting provider is just too confining. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe you should host your own website. Um, and especially to get started. For most people I talk to that are trying to do that, it's just a get, get going, get moving. Um, but think about it because you might move to that. So make sure that your data is portable and that you have the ability to move if you need to. But to get started, absolutely not. 
So, Adam, are you convinced? Should you or should you compose <laughs> your own site? And I'm still, it's something that I'm wrestling with because I want a lot of that control. But right now, for me, I think the, the work and the time that it would take to get that control does not outweigh the benefits of, um, you know, having it hosted and being able to just do what I need to do at the end of the day. So. Yep. Exactly, um, and and I think that that's really where we have to where we have to wrap it up is is you know what are you what where are you at what are you trying to do with it I mean frankly my opinion has always been you know if you're a company um, you should pay for services and one of the services you should pay for is not being your own sysadmin you know what I mean you know just just hire things um, you know it seems likely that you should be able to throw money at the problem you know as a company and say here. Do this thing for me. Make it work. Uh, that being said, I just moved all my stuff off of <laughs> hosted and into self-hosted because nothing, because it didn't work. And I was so frustrated with the level of service that I got, and I ended up, and so I'm a sysadmin again. I guess it's fun. Um, you know, but I would say that, uh, you know, kind of echoing what Gabe said there, um, whatever you do, especially if you're, if you're not self-hosting, especially if you're hosting with somebody else, don't be beholden to them. Get your own domain name. Yep. You know, control your RSS feed, control your domain name, control the front end, control your, your DNS. Um, you, you know, make sure that when the time comes to move off of WordPress or off of, you know, Medium or whatever, you know, that you can um, have, you know, control your own destiny and not lose all your content and not lose all your traffic. So with that being said, thank you for listening to the On-Premise IT Roundtable. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the show in iTunes, since that really helps our visibility. And please share the show with your friends. This podcast was brought to you by GestaltIT.com, your home for IT coverage from across the enterprise. For show notes and more episodes, go to GestaltIT.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>